Thank you for being with us. We're having this current affairs program in English every Friday night, and I hope you're enjoying it, and I hope you keep joining us too. Um, I'm joined now, I am with uh, the Honorable Dr. Therese Komodini Kakia, and we're joined by the chairman of the iGaming Europe, European Network, and he is Mr. Enrico Bradmonte. Thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. Um, what has your experience been um, since you've arrived in Malta and set up this network? Uh, first of all, good, good evening and uh, hello to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure, thank you for the invitation to, to come and uh, uh, speak with, uh, with yourself. Um, I've been in Malta now for eight years, and I was in a corporate environment before for one of the larger companies uh, here in Malta, present in the iGaming industry. And two years ago, I set up this industry trade association that we called iGen uh, to represent the sector here in Malta and uh, provide various stakeholders, uh, wh whether it's the government or the press, um, the uh, also non-profit organizations, with one common uh, voice, one common organization, uh, with whom we can have a dialogue. What are the standards um, of the rule of law required to give comfort and confidence to companies uh, such as yours, companies who come here, foreign companies who come and set up their operations on a small island like ours? I think the, the requirements of rule of law are the requirements that are upheld by any um, modern democracy, uh, any European uh, state. Uh, so either the, there is a rule of law uh, or there isn't. And the expectation that the iGaming industry, the uh, employees of the iGaming companies, uh, the shareholders of the iGaming companies uh, is that the, the companies operate in an environment uh, where the rule of law is uh, upheld uh, and the moral standards uh, are of the highest uh, level. So how do um, people feel, people who are running companies, um, rather than employees. How do they feel when they read um, press, the local press, and they see stories of corruption? Or, for example, we mentioned a bit earlier the murder of Daphne Caruana Galicia. How do they feel when, when there's a lot, of, um, a lot of mystery surrounding the circumstances? I would say... Um like any um, citizen, like any individual, uh, to see uh, and to, to uh, read on the papers um, these allegations, these stories, uh, to, to see corruption uh, and to uh, have, um, uh, whether it's government officials or, uh, or, or police, uh, not respecting uh, the rule of law is extremely concerning. I think this should be extremely concerning to anyone and everyone. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's uh, down to the employees of the gaming companies or the management of the, of the, uh, of the gaming companies or of any company. I think it's just a, 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 an ethical matter. Yes. And so what is uh, the scenario right now? I mean, we're going through a medical emergency, obviously, a medical state of emergency. But what is the scenario right now between the gaming companies that are um, still operating here? When it comes to the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, of course, we, um, we are affected in the same way as everybody else that is based in Malta. Um, the companies working um, in a high-tech industry because the online uh, gaming industry is online, it's a, it's a tech industry. Uh, we have transitioned the operations very quickly uh, from working in the office to working 
working remotely, working from home, uh, like I am uh, myself. Uh, when it comes to and maintaining the efficiencies of the operations, uh, when it comes to revenue, when it comes to the impact uh, that this is having on the top line, on the revenue of the companies, uh, as you know, of course, all the sporting events have been either cancelled or, 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 or postponed. And a big part of the revenues that the uh, gaming industry is uh, uh, dependent on is on the betting uh, on the sporting events. Uh, and that part has decreased. Um, dramatically because of course the uh, gaming uh, the sporting events have been have been captured obviously a very difficult time like everyone else i thank you very much for joining us enrico and i wish you all the very best thank you very much Therese, what do you think of uh, all these comments especially about the rule of law um, yes um in fact i quite Enrico sent me, set me thinking when you asked him about the COVID situation and, and you asked that question immediately after he was speaking of the rule of law. And to my mind, good governance, which is a heavy part of the rule of law, is very important in normal times. But it becomes even more crucial in these unnormal times. Absolutely. Because, Absolutely. you know, We've gone down through, we've been through a partial lockdown. We can't really say it was a full lockdown, although for a lot of businesses, it really felt like a full yes, lockdown. It did, yes. But what is happening has affected the way people behave, the way people think, and the way people are going to act. So if we want to come out from that to the new normal, people need to trust. And you need to trust whoever is administering your country. You need to trust whoever told you a month ago, stay home, and who now is telling you, go out. Yes. The businessman, the person who has invested in companies in Malta, and, and also Maltese businessmen, need to feel safe enough that their business can start again. So, you know, when, when, when you've already gained a reputation for bad governance, which therefore creates instability, and instability not just for governance itself, but also for some economic sectors as well, because it tends to tarnish their own reputation. It yes. makes it difficult for yes, them absolutely. to build, a, continue their relationship mm -hmm. abroad. Um, so when that happens, and you've already tarnished your reputation, and then this crisis comes along, if I were administering with that reputation, I'd really feel very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Because you need what people to trust you when yes. you've lost that trust. Yes. One thing I wanted to ask you, we're obviously going through a medical state of emergency. And uh, from November, we've had a lot of unrest politically. Um, obviously, the country needs to work together as one to bring the country back to a new normality. But where does this stop and start again? What we're discussing today, or does it carry on? You know, I mean, do we shelf it for a while, or do we? No. Does it need to carry on? You can never shelf working for your reputation. Once you shelf working, you once you stop working for your reputation, then your reputation stops. So you need to continue working, but you, you can't simply close a door on it. And I think what the three uh, persons who have joined us in the programme have really highlighted is that, you know, like, OK, you read an allegation of corruption. That's very negative news. Yes. If you read an allegation of corruption on a news item, but that news item says, the minister, upon receiving this allegation for corruption, has fired or uh, removed that person from office and the case is being dealt with by the police. And then a couple of days or weeks later, there's another news item which says, hang on, the police have arraigned that person, the police have investigated and have concluded their investigation, then... That's a different type of news. You, you're speaking of corruption yes, anyway. Yes, but, but the I, message is different. The, the first absolutely. message is 
Okay, I know there's corruption, but you know, I'll let it pass. I think the comments I've heard is um, quite a lot of people say it's not the time right now to be dealing with corruption matters because we've got a medical state of emergency. That's what the pub uh, quite a lot of the public yeah. are saying. It's, it's difficult. I mean, right now, for sure, our top priority is addressing people's health. It's really making sure that we get everyone safe. We need to protect our vulnerable people, but we also need to ensure that we're not exposing others. So that is our top priority, and that will remain our top priority throughout the pandemic. It, it, that will definitely be our top priority. But our top priority doesn't mean that you know, that things what will was once wrong again. becomes right. No, it, it, it doesn't. On the contrary, the, yes. a crisis makes what was wrong even worse. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you need to address it now, but you, you know, you need to address it because it, when business reopens completely, um, it's going to come back to you. Yes, absolutely. And it will come back absolutely. at you. Absolutely. We're joined now, Therese, uh, by Albert Marco from the United States. Thank you very much, Albert. And he's a U.S. congressional uh, political affairs specialist. Um, Thank you very much. I, I mean, I know you read quite a lot about our small island when we spoke. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all these allegations about corruption. How does this damage um, foreign trade and foreign relationships? In well, your the, the, com the comment from uh, the diplomat about the German, about, about Angela Merkel was, it was unfortunate. And the timing is not really, not really, not really that great. However, when it comes to trade right now, um, it, it takes a precedent of what's going on. But everyone in the European Union needs trade to flow. What I see from what I see from this incident happening is nothing at the moment. No one's gonna, no one's gonna be blowing up uh, four, five hundred billion dollars in trade deals at the moment. Just over a few comments. It's unfortunate, but you know. The Maltese government needs to do a little bit better job at uh, picking diplomats and you know people that uh, express uh, Malta's uh, willingness to be part of the European Union in a in a, con in a con cooperative way. Um, what do you um, what do you feel about political appointments as opposed to somebody who is a professional diplomat? Well. <laughs> Political appointments, whether it be in Europe, the United States, or Asia, are notorious for being uh, friends of friends and uh, more uh, more social and more social networking rather than actual professional appointees. And this is a big problem. It is a big problem. Is there something, if I may ask, is there something that we can call a healthy ratio of? Um, political appointees and prof professional diplomats? Well, uh, you know, Leah, there needs to be set parameters on how you pick, how you pick diplomats to represent your country and your interests abroad. You can't simply just pick a friend of a friend because he has a company that does deals with your friends. It just it doesn't work. The interest, there's conflicts of interest and then comments like, like were, that were said uh, about Angela Merkel, just they happen and they're negative. What are your comments about this? Uh, and uh, this is uh, an issue that we were actually, uh, uh, we started discussing in the beginning of the program, meritocracy, appointing people because they're really good for the job. Yes. And I think, you know, when you're a small country, um, and, and I, I hate saying that we're a small country because when you look at our political history and when you look at uh, everything that uh, people from our country have contributed at United Nations level, at Council of Europe, at, within the EU itself, um, then we're not small at all. Um, but, uh, um, uh, you know, if you want to keep that reputation, you really can't take the risk on appointing the person you like just because he's a friend of yours or a friend of a friend or just because he has heavily donated towards your political career. You need to make sure that your political career is stable. Mm. Your political career 
also, if you're the prime minister, is also your country's career. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about time that we start thinking of uh, uh, our country as deserving the highest reputation because our country has a lot to offer. Absolutely. And also because this is a country that has uh, um, a high standard generally of uh, human resources. Mm -hmm. Um, can I get back to you, uh, Albert, as a, a political uh, advisor on diplomacy, what would you advise a government whose, uh, whose ambassador made that gaffe, if we can call it that, um, to rectify the situation? Because I'm sure Angela Merkel is not very happy. How would you, what, what would you advise yourself? Well, I, I mean, without, without question that the Maltese government will be talking to their German counterparts. They will apologize. They will make sure that the next appointee is favorable toward the Germans. They're not going to escalate tensions with, with this problem. I mean, the, the Maltese government, although they're small, uh, you know, like you guys have just said, it, it has in great geoeconomic and geostrategic positioning for Europe, specifically for trade carrying on into Africa, which the Germans are going to need in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. And uh, I wish you all the very best and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you for Thank the you. comments. To conclude, Therese, we've spoken to a few people today. The, the topic's very vast. We've only merely just scratch yes. the surface because we can go on and on and have a program every night. Um, to conclude, what, uh, what, what points do you think that people should be um, observing? I think we should really first start by identifying that, you know, what the reputation that our country has taken is not the reputation of each and every one of us. On the contrary. There is a very big chunk, I believe the majority of people residing in Malta have kept and continue to keep the highest of standards in their profession and also in the way they behave socially and in the way they behave within the Maltese culture, mm -hmm. within the Maltese society and how they relate with others outside our shores. So I think that's the first take, the first thing we need to be aware of. That does not, you know, the reputation of this government and its previous uh, predecessor does not represent the reputation of the majority of the Maltese people. From there, if we really tr and truly believe that, then we can start taking action. But we can't take action unless we call a spade a spade. Absolutely. We have to call I found a spade it very interesting spade. speaking to these people tonight. It was tremendously interesting. And it was wonderful having you here. Thank and you. I thank you very much. I'm with the Honourable Dr. Therese Komodini Kakia. I'm Leah Hogg for Net Television. And I wish you a good evening. I'll see you next week.